expand our imagination. Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Cheryl Atkinson. The investigation continues into the bombing attempt in New York City. Was the would-be bomber Faisal Shahzad connected to the Taliban in Pakistan? And is Pakistan cooperating with the U.S. in the probe? CBS News reporter Farhan Bokhari joins me with the latest now from Islamabad. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. First, a quick question. Have we learned any new information that you can tell us about in the past couple of hours? Well, as you know, uh, new information is coming here literally by the hour. Uh, there have been uh, a series of arrests uh, in the last 24 hours to maybe 36 hours. A uh, number of those people who are uh, currently in custody are undergoing quite intense uh, interrogation. Increasingly, there's an emerging pattern which suggests that this guy uh, had connections, strong connections with Pakistan, his native country, but beyond those connections, he also may have systematically established connections with militant groups in the northwest frontier province, which uh, is really the hub of activities of uh, Taliban militants and also al-Qaeda. Um, and therefore, that is the direction in which this uh, entire investigation is going right now. So would you say that investigators seem to be, in Pakistan at least, leaning toward the notion that he was not acting as the so-called lone wolf, that he may have been part of a bigger effort? Well, absolutely, because if you look at the kinds of people who've been uh, uh, detained in the last 24 hours, arrested in the last 24 hours, uh, this goes on to suggest many of those people uh, do have well-established links with uh, with militant groups. And this goes on to suggest that um, uh, perhaps uh, some of those groups might be connected to Faisal Shahzad. At least that's uh, uh, the matter under investigation right now. Specifically, CBS News has learned that Shahzad may have spent up to four months at a training camp that is said to be affiliated with Pakistan's Taliban. The group that may be affiliated with the camp has claimed responsibility for the failed attack. Is that considered, do you know, a credible claim that this group is responsible or at least in part behind it? Well, the authorities here are still saying that the Taliban have no uh, known capacity to strike um, in foreign countries, distant countries, countries thousands of miles away. That is more the forte of al-Qaeda. But as time goes by and a certain pattern emerges, uh, I think increasingly the suggestion is that if this individual flew from the United States, came to Pakistan, established contact with people, went back with knowledge and expertise acquired here and used that to carry out this failed uh, bomb attack in New York's uh, Times Square, then of course there is a link uh, uh, link which is coming together, a link between this guy in the U.S. and his uh, trainers come facilitators thousands of miles away in Pakistan. And therefore, I think the whole idea uh, uh, that the Taliban do not have the capacity is something that may have to be uh, reviewed and perhaps reassessed uh, in the not too distant future. Even though the attempt failed, what does the Taliban stand to gain from a public relations standpoint or a world credibility standpoint among sympathizers if it's believed to have been in part behind the attempt in New York City? Well, um, at the end of the day, um, a sense of empowerment. Here are these people who are uh, practically a, a bunch of, of mainly ragtag people. They do have some basic weapons, but their level of known sophistication in a military sense is no comparison to some of the world's best equipped armies, the United States in, in particular. Therefore, uh, here you have these people uh, trying to convince themselves and their followers that they are capable of carrying out um, an attack or an, at least an attempt of this kind in the heart of the United States. For them, uh, uh, this is a uh, near big achievement and perhaps they'll try to do something similar in in future as well so the sense is that uh, at least they've acquired the capacity to pull something like this off farhan bakari in islamabad thanks for keeping an eye on this for us appreciate it thank you very much 
Last night kicked off the 2010 midterm elections. Three states held primaries. The races in Indiana, Ohio, and North Carolina may have confirmed what many politicians feared going in. It seems like it'll be an uphill battle for incumbents and the Washington establishment. The Loop21.com's Kelly Goff and CBS News chief political correspondent Mark Ambender are here now to break down the night's winners and losers and what it all means going into November. Kelly, first just give us a couple of sentences. What is the Loop21.com? It's a news site that covers politics and entertainment with a particular emphasis on op-eds and commentary and opinion that would be of interest to African Americans. Okay. I want to start with you, Mark, and an announcement by very powerful Democrat David Obi. Uh, that apparently you've learned he's planning to he's retire. He's planning to retire. He is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, which makes him one of the most powerful members of Congress. Uh, and his retirement had been hinted at because his disaffection with his job had been evident. Um, uh, but now that it's official, it creates a seat that Republicans can definitely pick up. It's a seat that's located in rural Wisconsin, uh, Barack Obama and... Uh, uh, and John McCain did pretty much, uh, you know, did, did fairly even even in the seat. So it opens up a seat, but symbolically, it also may send a signal to some other Democrats who are on the fence about retiring as well. That they it's may want to also them. jump over. It, I mean, if if David Nobi is doing it, um, it uh, you know, it might be that time for them to do it as well. It's, what it's do you worth, think, Kelly? It's worth noting too, Cheryl, that this is actually the the person who's most likely to win the seat now is Sean Duffy, who's been toint, uh, tainted, uh, excuse me, anointed as a rising star in the GOP. Uh, he's best known by some people in my generation for being a, a cast member on The Real World, as is his wife, and they've really become darlings of darlings of the conservative GOP establishment. Sarah Sarah Palin actually picked him as one of her candidates, gave him some money. She hasn't given a lot out, which has been written about. And so she sort of picked him and some others have as a rising conservative star. This is a seat that the Republicans would love to have. All right. Well, then let's look back at something that's already happened, the primaries last night. Um, Ohio is often considered sort of a bellwether state. And they had, um, what, five, five races opened up, five seats? Uh, well, primaries they, and five seats. They and had, a, you know, they had a, an important Senate primary and several House primaries. Okay. Um, uh, in the Senate primary, Republican primary, was for ordained Rob Portman, the former Bush administration official, former congressman, uh, will be the Republican nominee. Democratic nominee uh, will be Lee Fisher, uh, the lieutenant governor. What's interesting, though, about uh, the uh, the Fisher victory is that the margin uh, over. Uh, the Secretary of State who was running in the primary was 10 percentage points, which means that 45 percent of Democrats um, voting in the primary cast a vote against the, the primary winner. And that's a margin that's less than Democrats in Washington had wanted. It's a, it's a sign of the times, which is that the Democratic base is somewhat disaffected with the candidates that are anointed by the party chiefs in Washington. And, and that's not the only problem that Democrats have in Ohio, which is one of them being that Secretary of State Brunner, who came in very close behind uh, the, the winner of that race, which was pretty acrimonious, said blatantly on the campaign trail she would not campaign for him if he won, which is not exactly a way to build unity going ahead into what's sure to be a tough race in the general election. Any other surprises or things of noteworthy comment in Ohio? Well, well, you know, I think the whole noteworthy sort of takeaway from last night in general is that we've had the year of the woman, we've had the year of the Republican Revolution. This was really supposed to be the year of the anti-incumbency, the year of the Tea Party Revolution, and it really didn't pan out last night in the primary. Now, who that remains to be seen what's going to happen in the general, but, you know, all in all, we saw incumbents win these races. Even when they were tight races, they ultimately won them. You agree? Uh, I, I agree. I do think the, the competitiveness of the, of the races and the margin of victory, I mean, you switched to a state like Indiana where Dan Coats uh, won the Republican nominee for Senate. Three out of every five voters, Republican voters, didn't choose him. There were several other candidates. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and there's, you know, there's, a, there's a reason why these races are attracting fairly credible, well-funded well -funded challengers. Um, usually, though, the, you know, the benefits of incumbency are, 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 are enough to, to get over the hump. Um, uh, but we'll see. I mean, it, it, it is true that there were no major upsets last night. And uh, had there been some upsets, it probably would create a number of upset stomachs for now, party leaders here in Washington. Both of you watch this a lot more carefully than I do. But I would think the upsets would not necessarily be um, among Democrats beating other Democratic incumbents and Republicans beating other Republican incumbents, it's going to be when the Democrats are matched against the Republicans in the general. Is that a wrong way of thinking? 
Uh, no, I think that that's actually a, a pretty smart way of thinking. Uh, but I would actually argue that that the White House and the other Democrats who are sort of running things here in Washington are, are actually not so much casting an eye with concern towards 2010, but perhaps towards 2012. Because let's remember something that's very important, which is that these three states, North Carolina, Indiana, Ohio, John Kerry lost all three of them back in 2004. <laughs> President Obama carried them in 2008, but very, very tight races. I mean, he, he won, I think, North Carolina by less than 15,000 votes. Now, that's not exactly Florida 2000 numbers, but that's certainly not a mandate. So so, you know, I think there's going to be some trepidation with exactly what you're talking about, but not just for the midterms in terms of looking at the long haul for 2012. You touched on this a moment ago, but I was going to ask, did you see any sort of Tea Party influence in the primaries last night? Uh, there, were, there, there was some. There were certainly some in the Indiana Senate race. Um, uh, but once again, um, we, we really have yet to see uh, a race, and, and that might end the Kentucky Senate primary in a couple of weeks, but we have yet to see a race where the Tea Party influence has proved decisive, it mm. has proved enough to push a candidate over the top. And that suggests not necessarily something about the breadth of the movement, but how the movement has been able to translate or not been able to translate its energy into organization. I take your point about looking ahead to the next presidential election, but the last thing I want from each of you is comment on if you are a Republican incumbent or a Democratic incumbent, in Congress or the Senate, and you've watched these three prim primaries in three states last night, what are you thinking today? First to you, Kelly. Well, to quote Tip O'Neill, who famously said, all politics is local, um, I think a lot of people get sort of focused on the big politics, the big races, all the glam stuff, and forget that when your constituent services are very good and well and on point, then you tend to get reelected. That's why people like Senator Charles Schumer is one of those people that if you call the office and say you're having a problem with your post office, your call gets returned. That's how you stay in office, and I think you're going to see a lot of these incumbents focusing on taking care of the home base. Well, Indiana and Ohio are... are are two open seats, um, and I think in, in those those races tend to be nationalized a, a little a little bit more. North Carolina, because the Republican incumbent uh, is uh, uh, is um, staying in office, although his approval ratings are very very low for an incumbent. I think you may see um, the race Democrats try to race, make the race more referendum on what he's been able to bring back, back to the state. But Indiana and Ohio uh, serve as good proxies for the direction of the nation, particularly the industrial Midwest, which has hit, been hit so hard with the, with the economic collapse. So, you know, I think what all the candidates are thinking of on both sides is, uh, you know, even if they're Democrats and their parties are in power, how do I assert my independence from Washington? How do I prove that I'm not going to go to Washington to be the same big spender that everyone else is going to be um, at the same time? How do I keep my party faithful in line in an election year when the bases tend to vote and the middle tends to stay home? All right. Thanks so much, Mark Anbender, our political consultant, and Kelly Goff from TheLoop21.com. Great job. And that's it for Washington Unplugged. I'm Cheryl Atkinson. Check out my Follow the Money reports on the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. We'll see you next time.